Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to the December Our Revolution meeting. This is the uh, last meeting of the year. Hopefully, it's not the worst one of the year. I'm sure. I'm sure it won't be. We've got a very good uh, meeting lined up uh, for everybody. Um, I'll try to breeze through all of this as quickly as possible, just because we do have um, an education committee segment. Mark Goodland will be presenting on FDR second bill of rights. And then um, Ted Stewart with uh, the Howard County Police Accountability Task Force will be um, speaking to us about a campaign they're working on regarding racial disparities uh, in policing in Howard County. And then of course, just regular committee updates and what the uh, chapter has been up to. So um, ground rules as always, um, if you're not talking, please stay on mute. Um, if you would like to say something, you know, even just during the, when we're going through the slides at the beginning, use the hand raise feature, we'll, we'll call on you, um, you know, both for the education committee segment and, um, police accountability task force, we will have a chance for audience members to ask questions, make comments. Um, but please, you know, try to keep it to a minute or less just so that we can give everybody a chance. So, um, thank you. And then of course, be respectful. Um, uh, just some uh, quick updates on the steering committee. Um, as we uh, introduced at our last meeting, uh, Mary Latouri is the new co-chair. And um, aside from that, um, we now have a vacancy uh, for the secretary position. Um, Francis is still, uh, he was the secretary, he's still serving on the steering committee, but now this is a large member. Hey, Jake, uh, Jake, I think you're covering your mic or something. Hey, is that better? Okay, cool. Thank you, Mary. Hopefully it wasn't like that for too long. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, so uh, all that is say, we uh, are looking for a secretary. If anybody wants to up their level of involvement in the chapter as we you know continue to uh, try to build it into its next chapter here. And so um, you know, mainly secretarial roles is just you know sending emails to the list. We make the emails much shorter than than I make them. Um, and so people will probably be thankful for that. So uh, sending out emails to the list, um, you know, posting um, meeting notices on social media, creating events for it, uh, managing the membership list, um, you know, stuff like that. No, nothing too, too significant. So if anybody's interested, please let us know. We would love to have you. Um, and uh, Kat, uh, who was co-chair, um, had stepped down because she's running for Wild Lake CA board. And that's why Mary's in the role now. Um, Kat is uh, also uh, on the steering committee still, but just as an at-large member. And so uh, welcome back, Kat. Um, and again, if anybody is interested in secretary, uh, please let us know. Um, uh, there's our uh, link tree there and QR code if you'd like to follow us on social media. Um, become a voting member, join our email list, et cetera, et cetera, join a committee. Um, we've got a, uh, I will throw it to Paul for the treasurer's report. Although there's, uh, I don't believe there's anything new to update since last month. Um, I don't know if Paul, uh, out there. Sure. No, there's nothing new to update since last time. We have yeah. not been uh, spending lots of money. Um, there it is. $1,246 and uh, plus $283 plus $89.75. It's the same. That's it. I, I was delayed because there was really nothing new to report. Thank you. No worries. And yeah, if anybody's interested in this merch, there it is. There's the price ranges. Please let Paul know. He is the merch master. And so um, thank you, Paul. Uh, still healthy funds there. That's good. Um, uh, yeah, people are, are interested in getting more involved. We've got, you know, numerous committees that we're about to hear from in a second. Some more active than others, um, like our Education Issues Committee, County Legislation Committee, Social Event Committee, uh, Columbia Association Board Watch Committee. Um, with state legislative session coming up around the corner, uh, maybe worth uh, trying to get something going there. Um, people are interested in, you know, door knocking or field efforts, social media, electoral activities, direct service, you know, trying to have opportunities for people to do lots of different things. So please, um, you could fill out the 
Google form there if you are interested. Um, but uh, moving on, we will go to uh, updates from Paul on the education committee. Yeah, well, if you allow me to share, I have an update um, on the screen for me. Um, I will make you co-host. Sure, I'm sorry. Stop sharing. My okay, I'm okay. Yep. And let's see. Can anybody see that yet? Um, I don't think so. Okay, hold on. Bada boom. Anybody? There you go. These were some. Uh, can you see it now? Yes. Great. Uh, the first, these are three, six, about 12 topics that the, the committee has discussed. And uh, we only have one tentatively uh, scheduled where I've misspelled the word no. Uh, that's Yvonne on teacher uni unionism, what you need to know at the next meeting in January. Unless we have other material that would uh, bump Yvonne's talk. Um, the asterisk talks there, like uh, the second one with Diedrich and uh, and some of the others are longer, which might might uh, require uh, standalone meetings, as uh, we just experimented with. And um, they include uh, housing and justice, something that Diedrich has done two or three times, and it's terrific, or renewable energy in 2023, or the importance of the depth of the issue of choice, how women victories happen in Red states, public housing examples, the history of American populism, uh, how it's being distorted, explaining and understanding Bernie Sanders' approach to democratic socialism, learning from the 1934 epic campaign uh, in California with Upton Sinclair running for governor, and essential steps to ban dark money in Maryland politics. Um, we would love your opinions on these, not now, but at some other point. Uh, since the last meeting, we did uh, have a a joint full-blown meeting with our friends at Indivisible on understanding um, fascism and neo-fascism in America today, and it was very well attended. Uh, we had almost 40 people on, and it lasted 57 minutes, which was pretty tolerable. We had a great discussion, and um, that's, about, uh, that's all I have to uh, report unless people have questions or comments. Well, well, thank you, Paul. Um, and uh, sorry, I was not able to attend the standalone event because there is a conflicting event in the county, but happy to hear it. Uh, it went well and we do have, um, I could also put the uh, the link, first one put the link for the uh, committee Google Forms. Um, forgot to do that earlier, but uh, yeah, we, we uh, that's good that you all recorded it. And so, um we can uh if people didn't you know see it in real time they can watch it now so um thank you there paul right there cat just put the video in there um okay so uh next we're gonna go to uh uh if there's any updates from joan on the county legislative committee joan i saw you had emailed me the legislative tracker spreadsheet i put that in here so thank you for that Right. No, there were only uh, four bills. I, maybe that's for the, the end of the year. Is there a break? And they're all tabled. So there were two bills about public housing, um, well, rent control and buying um, affordable units who's, who can buy them and pricing and things like that. And one about forest conservation and one about children's meals and restaurants. So that's it. <laughs> There's four bills and they're tabled, but that was yeah. it. Yes, no, thank you, Joan. And um uh and so that, that means that it it's uh even that it's tabled for January, so it'll be voted on in January, but the the public testimony period for those bills is passed now, right? Yeah. Well, I from what I understand, there will still be um hopefully amendments, because especially for like the rent control one, there's only one amendment so far, and I think it, it needs a lot more work. But, yeah. Yeah, hopefully we'll see more action in November, in January. Yeah, leave that to us 
and mostly to Mary. We are on top of that, uh, the rent stabilization amendment. So um, thank you, Joan. Um, next, uh, Percy's not here with our social event, but we we unfortunately had to cancel our November social event. It was supposed to be a, a, a hike in Patapsco Park. Um, we had to cancel it because of the holiday, you know, Thanksgiving weekend. Um, myself and Mary and others were out of town and also just the, the cold weather wasn't the best time for a hike maybe. And so, um, we did end up having, uh, the December social event recently. Um, it was a, uh, white elephant gift exchange holiday party just, uh, two nights ago, Saturday night at, um, uh, uh, glory days bar and grill um there i am with my little present there um thank you drew roth for the bird suet um but yeah thank you uh you know cat france anybody who was able to make it. it was a good time we have not selected our january social event yet uh the the committee had uh been thinking about a snow tubing trip to white tail mountain ski resort if if there's enough interest i would do it but it's it's pretty far away so maybe we'll just maybe reschedule the hike then or do something else but um if people are willing and interested in going to you know whitetail mountain ski resort for snow tubing as a social event for the chapter please say say so in the chat just so i know you know that there's at least some interest again i would go if there's you know we get like at least you know maybe five or so people um but uh we could also do something local if there's not interest there. Um, but uh, feel free to sound off in the chat there. Um, but uh, I see we've got uh, Jim Hubbard on. Th thank you, Jim. Um, uh, don't know if you had anything you wanted to add on what's been going on with CA. Uh, well, the CA board met once in November and we'll meet again once in December on the coming Thursday. They're basically talking about uh, the budget. The, the, in the uh, community uh, programs and services part of the budget, the issue, basic issue is the fact that it doesn't cover all of its costs. The immediate issue they've been talking about is how to deal with the pool since they very much don't cover their costs, but there's interest in making them more uh, accessible to people. And they've talked about that at some length. I assume they're going to talk about it again on Thursday. On the other part of the budget, which is the community services, the issue really is, well, are they spending enough money to properly maintain all their assets, including the streams, the open spaces, the buildings, and so on? Uh, several board members have raised this issue. It's not, You can't tell from the budget, the way it's structured now, how what they're doing this year or the, in the budget year, how it relates to the long term. Now, they did say, the staff said that they were going to produce a capital investment plan uh, that would presumably provide that linkage of what's planned for 2025 with some of the long-term needs. That plan was supposed to be made available before Thanksgiving. It wasn't. It was supposed to be made available last week, uh, but it wasn't as far as I know. And so I don't know where that stands. I, um, they have promised me they're going to give me a copy. Uh, so I'm interested on Thursday whether they've actually finished doing that. Um, and then we can proceed to see how, uh, for example, in terms of the pools or the buildings, whether what they've been spending makes any sense. The The other issue that came up in, the, in light of this is the watershed management plan. It finally dawned on board members that the watershed management plan is 14 years old and was only a partial plan to begin with. So there was a discussion Thursday, would they instruct the staff to at least come up with a cost estimate of redoing the watershed management plan. Um, surprisingly, some board members didn't even want to do that. They, they were, um, Bill Santos and, and uh, Andy Stack both opposed having the staff spend any time on it, but the rest of the board went along with it. So that will be interesting to see on Thursday how much one uh, a redo would cost and whether there's real interest in the boards uh, on the part to spend the money to have a, a, a plan put together. It, it's, it would not be a simple undertaking. Uh, it probably would be expensive, but it's the logical next step. If you're saying you're maintaining the watersheds, you have to have some sort of plan. So we shall see. Well, th thank you for that recap there, Jim. Uh, 
Do, do you think that you had it? I know you've been talking for a long time that they need to assess their long-term spending needs on streams and other things. Do you think that you had any influence over them finally deciding to do that? Uh, well, uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, I did. I did send them something that made the point that the uh, if if you took if you went back and look at what they have spent on uh, watershed management projects, uh, their 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 spending is much much lower than it would have to be if they're actually interested in. Uh, completing what was identified in that plan 14 years ago. And I don't remember all the numbers off the top of my head, but the bottom line would be if you took their numbers seriously, they would have something like $30 million worth of work yet to be done. Okay. I mean, if you, if you look at what was in the plan, what they said they spent so far, and then subtract, you left with 25 to $30 million worth of work. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, that's good that, hopefully we're finally getting to see you know the peak behind the curtain what or we will soon when they make this plan public uh and i, I see uh dara dara baker from protector streams has joined us so hopefully you're doing a victory dance when you hear that they're reevaluating this watershed management plan and hopefully it's they don't make it worse you know, hopefully it's not just uh let's do more stream stream restoration so, projects. To be fair, the people who put the plan together did not recommend the kind of work that was done uh in Longfellow or that was proposed for Lake Elkhorn. They recommended reducing the amount of the water that went into the streams, not doing anything to the stream beds themselves. So in that sense, the plan was well done. Um the sad part is then the CA staff basically ignored that and bought into this Lake Elkhorn thing. Good to know. I, I've, I've not read through the plan, so I was, yeah, I was just assuming it was in there. Very few people have. Yeah, yeah, no, you're probably one of few. Um, but, well, thank you for that uh, update there, Jim. Um, and with that, we will go to uh, Sarah Pan. I don't know if you have any updates on... Um, You've been uh, active with the uh, group, you know, uh, organizing efforts against the uh, Moms for Liberty sort of, you know, local fascist uh, group. Um, other than the ones um, that I shared with you privately about um, Trent Kittleman um, being on the Resource Evaluation Committee, which is like a committee where they apparently like I don't know. I guess it's an advisory group about which materials should and should not be banned. But the people in the chat weren't very concerned about it since it doesn't really deal with um, policies and stuff like that. So hopefully Trent Kittleman won't have a very large effect on it. But also, Jake, do, do you want me to like talk about the things that have been going on in that like I'm sure like some parts of it could be addressed in the Palestine solidarity yeah. and yeah, I, um there's there's probably not a need to go into that the as that aspect uh of it um but I mean Kat you you can you can speak about it but I'm not sure if it's my place to speak about it but I would just say that they seem to be ultra focused on on running a um, a school board person, not as focused on fighting fascism or or really caring about our children or focusing on on attacks on our kids. And and I was in that chat and I recently left um, because I don't think these are the kind of people I would personally want to ally with. But if Moms for Liberty comes out, I, I certainly would go to another protest, but I don't want to support their board of education ideas and et cetera. I, I was kind of sickened by the fact that they thought it was more important uh, that there was a holiday party um, and it was protest, there was a silent protest and they thought that was so horrible. Um, and, and that's what they focus on. I, I, I just can't with people like that. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, as, as Sarah mentioned, you know, we uh we do have a slide on Palestinian solidarity actions that we've been involved with. And so we'll talk about that uh more in a in a second. But yeah, thank you for that update, Sarah. And uh thank you, Kat, for well, sorry you had to, you know, put up with that, but thank you for uh you know toughing it out. Uh but uh yeah, so um, you know, real quick, just updates on unionization efforts. Uh our friends at the Ellicott City Starbucks Union, they did do a ra uh, a strike on November 16th. Um, some of us attended, got news coverage, and they just put out uh, a, a request maybe a day or two ago. Um, they are doing a quote unquote uh, winter workshop with the workers on uh, this upcoming Saturday, December 16th from 11 to 3 um at that local Elkid City Starbucks and so encourage people to go to that um other than that um uh the other you know update on the union efforts locally is uh the Zum bus company who we had somebody from the neighbors for buses group present to our group in July about this controversial west coast bus company Zum who had had no business dealings on the east coast our school system canceled our existing contracts with the local bus contractors, paid this out-of-state company way more money despite claiming they couldn't afford raises for the previous contractors. And then um, so people think there's some pay-to-play things. And then, of course, day one of school happens, complete disaster, not enough drivers, not, you know, buses not showing up, kids don't have rides to school, ha continued for weeks big national embarrassment. I'm sure many of you saw it. And uh, because of all of that, um, the uh, Zum bus drivers, it only took like, you know, less than like three, four months. They're already starting to unionize. They're actually holding their vote to officially unionize or not tomorrow. Not sure what time, but so we should know soon. We'll keep everybody updated on how that vote goes. But uh, they had a rally um, those own bus drivers had a rally in support of the union efforts uh, last Wednesday. Cat was a speaker there because they're unionizing with Cat's union, McGeo. And so there Cat is. Thank you, Cat, for doing that. Um, and uh, so that's that's the union stuff. Um, and then next, uh, We've been uh, keeping the fight up with rent stabilization. Um, Mary, did you want to uh, speak a little bit about what's been going on there? What's coming up? Yeah, sure. Um, I can't remember if last meeting we had this information about um, our amendments being, we have a commitment from a council member to introduce all of our amendments that we requested. Um, but as Joan pointed out earlier, we do not have them all introduced yet. So we're or filed or whatever. We're working on um, getting those out uh, a couple. Oh my God, that was a week ago. <gasps> Last week was, um, sorry, it seems like a billion years ago now, um, the public hearing, <laughs> uh, which had gotten pushed from late November. Um and uh, yeah, so we, you know, mobilized a lot of our coalition members and um, some tenants as well to testify at the public hearing. And we had like a ton of people testify, a ton of people show up. So it was a really great, um, uh, I guess, like showing of our engagement um, and the popularity of our uh, uh proposals to improve uh council bill 44 um which if you have not been following is uh quite weak um and excludes a lot of um a lot of tenants and just overall like is not going to make a huge difference um for tenants in a positive way uh the way that it's currently written um oh here's tanika uh hey okay uh yeah, so we are continuing now to meet with council members in the next couple of weeks, hopefully leading up to the uh, the so the vote was or the bill was tabled, but the vote is happening Tuesday, yeah, January 2nd at seven. Um, we can we'll send out that information. Um, it's super important for us to show up there in person um, again, like, you know, we have signs and things like just applying that pressure till the last second, honestly. Um, and 
Oh, yeah. So I think Jake put the written testimony template in the chat so you can still submit written testimony. And um, we really encourage you to uh, do that. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. You just send it to an email. And we have in the, the Google Doc that Jake linked um, information about our amendments and the things that we're asking for. Um, so that's pretty much it. Anything anyone else wants to add who is um, working with the coalition? Feel free. I, I think, uh, thank you for that update, Mary. And, uh, you know, thank you for leading this effort. And thank you, Kat, Sarah, and, and especially, you know, Jim Hubbard has been super, super helpful with uh, the, the author of most of the amendments uh, himself. And so thank you uh, to everybody who has and to been- Nika, who just know, popped on as well. Hi, Tanika. Tanika yeah. I swear, Tanika heard Rent Stabilize. She heard us talking about it. And she got on the, the Zoom. Um, Thank you, Tanika. How you doing? Are you trying to talk? It's like super muffled if you are trying to talk. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we, we can't hear you, unfortunately, Tanika, but I know you're with us in spirit and thank you for all your help with uh, rent stabilization. Um, but, uh, Yes. So, um, anyways, uh, so thank you for that update, Mary. And yeah, please submit that written testimony. It's already written for you. You just have to click a button. Very similar to Police Accountability Task Force's uh, letter writing campaign, which they will speak about real soon. But um, last thing uh, before we uh, get to our uh, education committee, um, uh, uh, no worries, Nika. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for being here. Um, but yeah, last last update before we uh, kick it off to our education committee uh, is, um, you know, uh, now uh, with, you know, what has been going on since, you know, October 7th, um, really, you know, long before October 7th, but that's the, what's really heightened it currently, October 7th. Um, there's been, you know, a lot of uh, violence uh, in the Middle East going on with uh, Israel and Palestine and, um, you know, uh, us, like many in the progressive movement, you know, been, you know, uh, involved with, you know, various Palestinian solidarity efforts. And um, it's looking like this isn't ending anytime soon. And so we've got more things planned in the future. And so um, I've been fairly engaged. Several of our members have been fairly engaged. But if anybody's like really this issue speaks to them and they want to like take lead on behalf of our Rev Hoko on these actions, you know, planning them, getting more involved with them, you know, keeping, you know, the, the, the club involved with what's going on. Um, you know, please, uh, you know, please, um, you know, uh, let, let, let us know. Uh, yeah, Paul. No, I'd, I'd be happy to be engaged in this. I'm desperately interested in making sure that there is a uh, peace in the area and that, uh, the Palestinian people are liberated from the terrorism uh, of uh, Hamas and that Gaza can have uh, its own independent right to self-determination. And I'll put in the, uh, in the chat uh, what Bernie just said about this uh, just uh, three days ago. Yes, thank, thank, thank you. you. I know. Yeah, I know. Uh... You know, not uh, it's hard to find politicians willing to speak out. And, you know, Bernie is one of the the ones who will, you know, be at least somewhat, you know, critical. Um, and so that's uh, no, he, he insists on a on a uh, on a long term piece together. Ceasefire, even if it means gluing together many truces, um, but uh, he's uh, has no illusions about uh how um, the Hamas terrorists are treating not only the hostages, but uh, using the people of uh, Gaza, the poor Palestinians, as a uh, cover for their terrorism. That's all. Read the statement. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, well, thank you, Paul. And I see Hiri's got his hands up. And I should have said, I forgot Hiri was on, but yeah, Hiri's been like, 
you know, really like the one sort of leading this stuff at the local level. And so, you know, I've been playing more of a support role. And again, if anybody else wants to do that with our rep, great. But uh, yeah, Harry. Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Jake. Um, we certainly, uh, in, you know, need um, a lot of, uh, you know, so, you know, uh, support. I do. I feel like this is a sort of a, like you know this is a watershed moment here, uh, in terms of uh, you know how people respond. Um, I uh, you know definitely don't you know not for the sake of back and forth here, but uh, I I feel like uh, you know Bernie Sanders' response on this issue has been uh, one of the most disappointing ones uh, because of, because of the way it's been framed in terms of the you know. Um, um basically the the death and destruction and the fact that you know there are uh you know all these people have died on you know all these palestinians have died uh you know they're they're they you know hamas is responsible for you know for all the bombs that are being dropped on people's homes you know it's an unfortunate take but um in any case you know it would be good to have uh you know more you know more people just calling for a ceasefire and bernie sanders uh, has not called for a ceasefire uh he's he's what he has said is hamas wants a ceasefire which is you know basically what ipac has thanked him for um just as recently as yesterday and so um you know um we just you know we just need to say ceasefire we want our local elected officials to say ceasefire there's nothing wrong with saying stop killing children um and uh you know uh we need to just uh advocate for that and 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 more important and you know this is not just not saying more importantly but there's a there's a huge there's a there's a very scary climate of fear in at the county at the state level and of course and you know the the federal level that, you know people don't want to say ceasefire because they you know somehow that seems to be taken as anti-Semitism. So we need to make sure that people's First Amendment rights are not being infringed upon. And there's a, you know, there's a strong Israel lobby that's, you know, that's been, um, you know, that's been, uh, that's been successful in instilling this climate of fear uh, that's prevented, for, you know, people from speaking up. And, uh, you know, uh, that's what, you know, we need to address too in this county. Yeah, Paul, I see you got your hand up. We'll go to la last comment from you, and then we'll move on. Just because I, I absolutely that. agree. We need, we definitely, the world needs a ceasefire in the Middle East. Everybody has to stop the killing. It's unnecessary. It's violent. It's bloody. It's terrible. But uh, everybody has to stop. Hamas has to stop. Hezbollah has to stop. The IDF has to stop. This is unfortunately what I usually hear from those people uh, who are for Palestinian solidarity is a ceasefire on one side. And that is not uh, the way to peace. The way to peace also means having international bodies like the United Nations and responsible countries um, come and play an intermediary role in this horrible conflict where so much killing and, and unnecessary deaths is happening. I would love to see Jordan and Egypt have the guts to come in and play that kind of role. Unfortunately, we haven't seen it yet. I think a demand that the that Egypt and uh, Jordan, who have a great number of Palestinian people in their countries, come to the aid of their of their Palestinian brethren by calling for uh, uh, peace negotiations, ceasefire on all sides. And uh, I'm just saying we need to give peace a chance. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for that, Paul. And like I said, we'll uh we'll move on now. But I, I will just I can't speak for anybody else. I can just speak for myself. When I say ceasefire, I do mean ceasefire on all sides. Stop the violence on all sides. And to the extent that you know people say it directed towards Israel, I'd speculate maybe it's because they're looking at just like the body count on both sides and just seeing like you know a lot more people been killed on the the Palestine. But I. I do agree. Yes, yeah, ceasefire all the way around. And with that, we will um, move on. We've we've got some other stuff, you know, coming up with that. But we've got uh, 
that upcoming events here. We, you know, for those who are interested, um, including, you know, sharing your, your perspective, um, there's going to be in local, uh, uh, local, like, you know, town hall to talk about It's called Palestine, uh, anti-racism and free speech. Um, and, you know, Harry again has been taking lead organizing. This is Tuesday, December 19th at the central branch, uh, public library, um, at, at 6 30 PM, you know, opportunity for community members to go share their thoughts. So, um, there's that. Um, and then also there's going to be a state rally. That was the, uh, uh, the uh, flyer for it earlier, uh, state rally, uh, free speech, but also, you know, ceasefire, um, you know, Palestinian solidarity, not not Hamas solidarity, pal Palestinian solidarity um, rally uh, in front of the state house on Sunday, January 7th at noon. That's just the, the last Sunday before session starts three days later, Wednesday, January 10th. Um, and that's going to be at Lawyers Mall and a lot of different, you know, state groups uh, coming together for that. And so it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a hike to Annapolis, but I think it might be worth it. And so I would encourage people to go to that. And so um, without any further ado, I'm sorry for the wait here, um, but uh, I will uh, now introduce uh, Marg Goodlin, for, former steering committee member, still uh, education committee member and general member Mark Goodlin going to uh, present to us on behalf of the Education Committee on FDR's Second Bill of Rights. So, thank you, Mark. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. It's good to see you. Okay. I need to go to my screen here and I, I can make you a co-host so you can uh share your screen as no well. i'm i'm good oh, okay um share my screen yes where do i find that um, i will stop sharing mine to make it a little bit easier for you um it's at the the green button in the middle maybe bottom middle of the zoom Ah, okay. I um had to get rid of Zoom in order to get my. Was it the video you were going to show? Yeah. Um. Okay. I, and I've got slides as well. Oh, okay. Um. Let's see. Share screen. There we go. You got it? I think so. Hold on. One oh, second. there you go. Okay. There we are. All right. I'm going to be talking about FDR's second Bill of Rights. Um, it was proposed in 1944 uh, during his State of the Union address. He was arguing that the original Bill of Rights had proved inadequate to ensure us in e equality in the pursuit of happiness. He stated that having such rights would guarantee American society and uh, American security, and that the place of the United States in the world depended on how far those rights had been put into practice. And I'm going to play the, the film. Well, maybe I am. It's not coming on, however. Uh, it might be because um, if you hit, con try to do control click. Control okay. click. That there we go. There you go. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, yeah. Fixing the volume. Uh, 
I assume others can't hear that too, right? Really? Okay. Uh, Francis says there's a share sound button in Zoom. Um, okay. Could you help direct her to how she would find that, Francis? I think it's under share screen, the arrow up. Or, or possibly under, yeah. Yeah, go to share. Oh, oh. what? Mm. That's not what. It, that's not what it was. Do I have control right now? Oh, yeah, I think you're a co-host. Yeah, um, All right, oh, wait audio a settings. That's where it is. Um, Sorry about the technical okay, difficulty. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's jump ahead. Um yeah, you could do the slides and Francis could look for the button and once he finds yeah. it, maybe we could Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. The um the rights that he was talking about include the right to a useful and remunerative job in the industries or shops or farms or mines of the nation. The right to earn enough to provide adequate food and, rec and clothing and recreation. I think it's interesting that, that he included. No, oh, hold on. I don't know how to get rid of. I don't know how to get rid of what's playing. Maybe I'm the only one that can hear it. The right, yeah, the right the video. enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation. Um, oh, I think sorry. it's interesting that that um, that he included recreation in that. The depression made poverty pervasive and um, war meant sacrifice was pervasive. Okay, next. The right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living is, is another right. The right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad. The right of every family to a decent home. The right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health. Can you all under hear me? Over this. Yes. Yep, we can. Okay. For me, you're kind of like uh waving in and out like a, a little bit. The volume uh, seems to be really changing a lot while you're speaking. I'm gonna. Oh. <laughs> okay. Mark, Mark, uh, let's see what uh, it's still playing the video in the background. You're saying for you. Yeah, but I I just got rid okay. of. Okay. Oh, look. look see that? Down. No, pull that pull that screen up again that you just had up. Okay. You see that pause button? No. Uh, this up. Okay. Yeah. Did that We're work? We're good. We're good. Yes. Okay. That does. Thank you. Go. Yeah. I'm sorry about all this. I'm not. I haven't done this before. I uh, no. It it's so on my end. I I could hear you still very you know fair fairly well i i've i've heard everything you you've said so just uh continue i i, I it, it's 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 so far so good thank you okay the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health and that includes medical dental and eye care the right to adequate protection from economic fears of old age sickness, accident, and unemployment. So that means adequate social security, which we don't have currently, Medicare or Medicaid, and unemployment insurance. 
and the right to good education. In those days, that meant elementary and secondary education. But these days, that includes college. And here, here are all the, uh, the various rights. And basically, the, the film was just FDR reciting these as well. So we didn't really miss anything for not having it. Are there, um, and I'd like, I guess, to point out, we don't really have a lot of this at this point. Um, some, what, 44 to 23, some 80 years later, we don't, we don't have a lot of this. We do have the, the Medicare and Medicaid and, and uh, Social Security, although Social Security is not adequate. Um, currently, and we have some medical care for some people, um, but a lot of the rest of it is not is not available to to most people. Okay, are there any questions? Um. So what do you do you know like why this never passed like why why this never like what what ended up happening with this died fairly soon after that so I assume mm -hmm. that's why it was not um, it was proposed in his State of the Union but but wasn't passed mm. well that's unfortunate um, yeah all I'll say is like it's really interesting being in law school right now I just took an administrative law class and like basically like so much like of legal precedent and like how the courts decide things was determined when FDR was president that it was like a super transitional period because the courts became their last way to like stop all this stuff that would be good for regular people mm -hmm. using the courts to strike down everything so they were, you know, making every, you know, saying, oh, that, you know, the government can't regulate, you know, anything. And so that's when FDR started to try to pack the court. And then suddenly the court gave up on everything. But I'm curious if the courts would have fought him on stuff like this, because, you know, if it truly is a Bill of Rights, that's, you know, damn near a constitutional amendment. And what's what's all what's really interesting is all those doctrines that the court used in like the 1930s to strike down all of his programs the new supreme court today is reviving all of those doctrines so it's like we're reliving yeah. you know 100 years later same stuff happening um yeah. and uh i see francis has the video now um and and Fran i think uh i think you are co-host see if see if it lets you uh share your screen Oh, Fran, uh, talk, talking to Francis. Oh, there you go. He he said he figured out how to play the video, Mark. So, uh, oh, we'll okay. Do I don't know if anybody still wants to see that. It's only two minutes long. I'm uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I I'd, wanna, I'd like to see it. Accepted. Okay, go ahead. A second bill of rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all regardless of station or race or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom, freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care, and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accidents, and unemployment, the right to a good education. All of these rights 
spell security. And after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. For unless there is security here at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. Good thought. Thank you. Yeah, Paul? Martin, it looks like, oh, sorry. Yeah, Paul, did you have something to say? No, I just wanted to second your, your assumption that FDR died soon thereafter, and this was done in January of 44. 15 months later, he was dead. The war in Europe was still going on and in the Pacific. Uh, it was uh, June of, uh, May of 45 before uh, Germany surrendered and August of 45 before the Japanese surrendered. So uh, I think this was on his uh, short list for things to do once the war ended. The British house, I mean, and among these things were the, you know, the, the, the right to adequate food and those of us uh, are promoting uh, the right to have food when we engage in, in activities such as we discussed last month, or maybe it was the month before on uh, uh, with uh, Sanjay and the uh, Indian Cultural Association and the food banks distribution and the right to a decent home where everybody's working here. All, a whole bunch of us are working on uh, in the, in the chapter working on uh, uh, the right to a decent home and the right to medical care. And we've been pushing this for, as long as uh, uh, our revolution has been in existence. And this is part of what uh, inspired and, and uh, pushed Bernie. I mean, he had four pillars to his campaign and to his uh, ad, uh, ideological advocacy. You know, what FDR promoted in the, in the best parts of the New Deal, including the Second Bill of Rights, that was one. Uh, the mission and, uh, and the delivery of uh, civil rights and uh, the spirit and vision of uh, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. The third was uh, the advances of uh, European Nordic social democracy. And the fourth was the dynamism of the message of Eugene B. Debs in the early 1900s. So, you know, FDR's uh, second Bill of Rights is pretty significant. I would also add that it was interesting, the British had to wait until the the war was over before they got their national health insurance. And and uh, they initiated it as soon as they possibly could when the Labor Party won the next elections and uh, and the conservatives were thrown out right after right after the war, not during the war. That's all I had to say. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Nicely done. Thank you. Ivan. Mart, hi, thanks. That was very well done. Um, I was wondering whether when he said the right to a good education, whether that just meant through high school or did it mean college also? I imagine back then that it probably meant just secondary education or elementary education because there weren't that many people going to college at the time. Um, but that's that's my interpretation. He didn't specify. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Kat, did you want to say something too? I, I had a question. I just wondering if Mark knew this about FDR. I mean, this stuff is amazing that he put into place. I mean, that he wanted to put into place. But I always find very disturbing was that during World War II, when Jewish refugees came for refuge to the United States, he turned away thousands of them, knowing, knowing he had basically sent them back to their deaths. How do you deal with that contradiction? Because that upsets me a lot because we could have taken them in, easily taken them in. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Um, I, I think um, 
he was a human being and he probably had some political uh, opponents. Um, I don't know. It It's unfortunate. He wasn't perfect. So yeah, that, that is a question that a lot of people ask. It is usually phrased as a question also related to why he didn't bomb the trains to Auschwitz. Um, and Mark's answer is correct. A lot of it had to do with political pressure. It's important to remember that it was the 1924 Immigration Act that required quotas based on what part of the world that you come from that privileged white people from Western Europe, not even, you know, tried to keep out Irish, tried to keep out Italians, very few limitations. And basically they were stuck with a Congress that was not only incredibly isolationist, but also um, incredibly both anti-Semitic in the Jewish sense, but also anti-Semitic in terms of the entire Middle East. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, the they did their best and so if anyone has ever heard of Raul Wallenberg um he was a incredible man and um disappeared at some point they believed that the Soviets captured him took him to the gulag and had him murdered um but he actually worked to provide papers to people um to uh try to get them out if it was possible um, I think the worst case that, you know, people tend to refer to is the St. Louis, which was a ship that came and tried to offload in Cuba, tried to offload in the United States and was sent back. And then if you trace the history of anybody who was on that ship, it was um, not a good ending. Um, so, yeah. I think they were returned to France or something. Yeah, I think they ended up having to return to France. There was... Um, I and believe so, when they traced it, most of them did die. They yeah. perished. Yeah. And so, and a lot of it also just had to do with the fact that no one at that time wanted refugees that they could not, you know, address. There was also a lot of concern, particularly in the 19, 1930s and leaving up to the war with Poland, that a lot of Jews were radicals. So they were communists and they were socialists and they were disruptors. Um, and people didn't want them for, for that purpose either. Um, and that is also the same. It's also important to remember, and people do, you know, we, we emphasize the Jewish deaths in the Holocaust, but 6 million others were killed, including political prisoners, the Roma, people with disabilities. Um, uh, and they were also, you know, incredibly, incredible hardship for people, you know, who were under German occupation. So, yes. Um, this was also a time when there were a lot of Nazis in the U.S., working to undermine FDR and um, white supremacy was quite a common thing at that point too, and anti-Semites anti as well. Okay, Yvonne. Hi, thank you. Um, this is an interesting discussion because, well, all over the world, but especially in this country, we have a problem with making our leaders into heroes. And you have to be able to see them in all their good and their bad. Um, the people who wrote our constitution uh, okayed slavery. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul, you will remind me, but every president, except for the two Adamses, Every president up until Lincoln had slaves. Lincoln, I think, was the first one, aside from the Adamses, that did not hold slaves. Am I right, Paul? You're right. Right. Yes. Martin didn't hold slaves, but that's because he was poor. I'm sorry? Martin Van Buren didn't have slaves, but that was because he was poor. Oh, okay. So we have to we have to be able to explain that. We're still protecting the Constitution, but it was written by uh, human beings that were extremely imperfect. And uh, Lincoln himself did not begin by wanting to, uh, to uh, liberate the slaves. He felt like he had to do it in order to um, 
win the war, really, to win the civil war. So we have to be able to explain that. And I believe that Hori put something in there asking why would we want the trains to be bombed to Auschwitz? Hori, it wasn't the trains, it was the train tracks that they wanted bombed so that the trains wouldn't be able to proceed to Auschwitz. So, and the, and the reason, by the way, which, which Roosevelt gave for not wanting to do it is that it was private property. So figure that one out. <laughs> Can't bomb private property. <clears throat> so we have to live with that. Have to be able to explain why people do good and why they do bad. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very complex time. Looks like here he's got his hands up, her hand up as well. I just want to say my dad was in World War II, just, just to keep it in perspective. So <clears throat> yeah, uh, I I mean, I, I think uh, we would all agree that, you know, the times would have, you know, different complexities and contradictions. Um, unfortunately, I think what happens is, you know, after those times are over, at least in this country, uh, I mean, and perhaps everywhere, we only pick the, like the, the easy explanations about the people who are, who are there at that time. And I, I would argue that, you know, for the most part, you know, we, in, in this country, we have not internalized just how vicious this country was to, you know, to people of, you know, to black people, um, you know, like, um, it's not, it's not in, in the veins of people who live here, who were born here, uh, un, you know, until you actually start, uh, you know, looking at, you know, the, the books or, you know, it's, it, it, we just, we, we don't, we don't take the effort to learn from that. And so, yeah, I think, you know, FDR had contradictions uh, um, and, you know, people before him had contradictions, but there's a tendency to, to gloss over those, those contradictions after it's, after it's, you know, um, when we, when looking back and, um, that leads us to, uh, I think, uh, you know, repeated mistakes, unfortunately, but, um, uh, um, he did good things, but, you know, we probably didn't learn from the bad things. Well, I'm not seeing any other hands up. Um, I think we have a good segue into uh, Ted's presentation because of all the abuse of American citizens and, and not American citizens in this country. And it's still going on. Yes, and it is happening disproportionately along racial lines. And so with that being said, thank you so much, Marg. Great job. Good, good to see you again. And thank you. Uh, learned quite a bit uh, from that presentation. And so um, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, and so right, I'll no be with <laughs> yes, yes. Round of applause. We, we even we got technical difficulty solved and all we got it done. Um, so yes. Uh, yeah. So um, with with that being said, yeah, we are going to now transition to our uh, second speaker of the night, um, Ted Stewart, uh, with the Police Accountability Howard County Police Accountability Task Force. And Ted, did you need to screen share or anything? Yes, yes, I do. Okay, I will give. Got half half the people on the call co-host. Co oh, you already got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Marge. That was very informative, and um, I learned a lot. <laughs> I already I, I knew that he had um, two sides. There were some good, a lot of good things that he did, but there were also some issues as it related to racial disparities and and his policies as it relates to people of color. So, 
it was a dichotomy when you look back on his record. Uh, to, to, and it kind of uh, falls into what's going on here in Howard County a little bit as well, because um, a lot of people think that these racial disparities in policing happens other places, but it really is happening in Howard County as well. Um, so what I wanted to do today, this deck was prepared to really give you an update in terms of what's happening in Howard County. Um, some of the, this information was surprising to us as well, and we've been on a journey um, learning this information over the last um, seven or eight months and trying to work with uh, Howard County leadership to um, put things in place to um, remedy this. Uh, we've been working with them, but there seems to be no sense of urgency. Everybody seems to be um, just moving very, very slowly and not, not with any sense of urgency. Um, so we, we got involved with learning about this um, through some police accountability meetings earlier in the year. They had to ask the uh, police department to provide information in terms of their demographics as it relates to engagements with Black African Americans and other people of color. And there was just some disturbing information that came about as, a, as, a, as it relates to the information that the Howard County Police Department shared and also the Sheriff's Department. Uh, they shared information as well. The information that I'm showing you, I have some graphs to show you with specific information that we got from the, the Howard County Police Department they did mention in the meeting, it, the PAB did get the information, but we were not able to get it. So um, the graphs that we're showing has to do with uh, Black and African Americans, but we didn't have the specific racial demographic information on Hispanics and other people of color, but they did mention in the meetings that there were similar racial disparities for other um, uh, racial um, groups as well. Um, we also did, um, we, have a, we have a wonderful person our, on our team who has a PhD in mathematics. And one of the things that Chief Dare said uh, during the meetings, he was when he was challenged to say, well, why are you stopping um, black African-American drivers um, more than any other, more than their representation in Howard County? He, he speculated, but didn't have any proof that these were drivers predominantly coming from other counties. I guess, you know, with the quotes, he didn't say it, but probably trying to say that they're coming from Baltimore and other parts of um, PG County. I'm not sure what he was trying to say. And unfortunately, the PAB accepted that um, explanation, but it wasn't, it was no substantiation. And he, he said he was speculating. He really did not know. And he did not indicate that he was going to do any more detailed research to find out what the answer was. So we believe that urgent action is required. We've been working for several months, but first let me just give you two seconds on us. We started, we're Howard County residents. We started in the summer of 2020 after the murder, murder of George Floyd. And we, um, when we first got together, we, we wanted to do something where we weren't really sure what we wanted to do, but we felt that we pr should probably focus on our own community in Howard County. It's very difficult to change things as you get upper up the ladder in terms of the state and at a national level. So we kind of wanted to focus on Howard County. We've had, so we focused on specific campaigns. So our first campaign was a body worn camera program. At the time, Howard County did not have a program and uh, we, we pushed to get that program in place. And then in the middle of getting that in place where we got promises, um, um, the county executive um, defunded the program. So we took the money away and then we fought and finally the county council approved the money for the program. So that was, was a lot of drama there. We also were involved with um, the police accountability board legislation across the state. The Maryland state requires that major counties have a police accountability board, but they leave it up to the county executive to, to determine what the structure should look like and what how it's gonna work and what type of tools they have. And the initial legislation that came from the county executive was very weak. It also was very um, law enforcement centric, where most of the people on the board would have been from the um, police department. So we worked very closely with the county council members to get some of that legislation changed. We weren't successful on all of it, but we were able to get some legislation changed where they, where, where they changed the structure of the board and they gave them some tools to be able to be more. Um, involved in terms of police accountability. And a current project is this racial disparity project. Uh, we have, and thank you very much for being a, a partner with us. So you've been supportive 
all along. So we really do appreciate your support. These are our other coalition partners. We, we partner with other um, organizations throughout the county. This is the one slide that really got our attention. This was presented back in June of 2023. The um, racial demographics in Howard County is roughly about 20, 21%. And uh, the Howard County Police Department in, showed us, uh, showed the police department, I mean, the Police Accountability Board, these stats. 58% uh, of the arrests um, were Black African Americans, although we represent 21% uh, of the population, 59% of use of force. 56% pointing a weapon, gun or taser, uh, adult criminal citations, juvenile uh, citations, and also the sheriff part department as well had um, racial disparities in their number. So the question really is why? We don't really, we have, uh, we suspect certain things, but we really need to do, you know, dig deep and find out why this is happening. And we need to figure out um, what are we going to do about it? Uh, one of the things that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Chief Durr speculated is that this, um, these, um, these high, this high, this, you know, this racial disparities were from people driving from other counties. Um, someone on our, uh, someone on our, uh, in our group, did a study going back five years. The numbers are still pretty much the same. They're almost twice the um, number of black drivers stopped uh, relative to our, our racial demographic representation in the county. We also looked at one of the things, the Maryland race-based traffic stop dashboard, anybody can look this up. We found that they actually show you where those traffic stop, where the residents are who are stopped. And uh, it shows you what county they're coming from and also what, um, if they're coming from out of state as well. And the numbers still don't support um, the number of stops. So even if we look at all of the stops from all of the people coming into the county, we're looking at um, black drivers and um, other people of color being stopped much higher than their racial demographics. So what have we? What did we do about it? We immediately started talking to the county executive office. We've met. We've had several meetings with the police department. We've had meetings with the count, uh, the police accountability board, and we we're also starting to meet with the uh, county council. We met uh, directly with Ms. Cavallon. She's the chief of staff for Dr. Ball. We told her about um, this, um, this disturbing information. She indicated she was concerned and she coordinated a meeting with us in the police department to talk about it. They mentioned at that meeting that they're looking to put together some type of a racial equity strategic plan that's going to look across the whole county on issues as it relates to health care, um, policing, education, and so forth. We said to her, that's not sufficient. You need for us to be able to determine what's causing this, uh, th these racial disparities in Howard County as it relates to policing. You need to bring in a third party expert that is knowledgeable in terms of how to conduct that study. They're knowledgeable about uh, police, the algorithms in terms of how to get the data. Uh, they look at um, hiring practices and a variety of other things. You, you can't bring in this generic person to look at the specific problem in the police department. So we've let them know that that's, that's um, not gonna solve the problem and that's not acceptable. It's almost like you're having a heart problem, you're getting ready to have a heart attack and you're bringing in a general practitioner to give you advice in terms of what to do about your heart condition. We've also had meetings with uh, Chief Durr and we met with his senior staff. They acknowledged that there's a problem. However, they have not communicated any plans to expeditiously address these disparities. They just said, you know, there's a problem, <laughs> but they're not, they haven't said they're not going to do anything about it. They, they talk about training. They have these training course, court courses and stuff like that. But that's about all he said that they're they're putting together training training courses for the police department. The uh, police accountability board. We've been very disappointed with them. They've had this information since um, June um, when the police department presented it to them. Um, they've seen they've had the police department come in to explain it, and they take their um, explanations without any substantiation, and they have not done anything further. Um, to um, with a sense of urgency to address this issue. So we've been very um, concerned about them. We've sent them uh, several letters. Um, they've only responded once. 
Um, they did in their last meeting, they did indicate though from the information that we sent them that they did agree that we need to bring in a third party. So at least we're making some progress. That was in their, la in their, their meeting in December this month. Uh, so after six months, they did decide that we need to bring in someone to take a look at this data. But they have we have three recommendations. They didn't uh, move on any of the other two recommendations. We've also met with uh, uh, we met we met with Deb Young earlier in the year. She was very concerned about the data and very very supportive, and we really appreciate her support. She advised us that we should be continuing the conversations with the. Um, the county executive's office with the police department, the PAB and other council members. And uh, she asked us to come back to her um, when we, if we needed more support, which we're going to be doing it. When we get to my recommendations, you'll see that we're going to need to get the county council involved with this. Uh, we do have a meeting with uh, um, Liz Wall. She, she actually reached out to us after she saw this information. She contacted us directly and we're scheduled to meet with her in January. We haven't heard from the other county council members yet, but we're going to try to schedule a meeting with them um, in January or February. So we have three recommendations. I, they're very reasonable. Um, number one, we need to bring a third party expert in the field of police accountability to assess the root causes. And this would be across all racial, um, um, including all racial bias, uh, you know, all, all, we, we look at the whole uh, spectrum of um, people within Howard County. And we need to develop, have this expert develop a comprehensive uh, mitigation plan. Uh, we actually even gave them a, an example of best practice uh, after the murder of um, Walter Scott in, in North Charleston, uh, they brought in a, a third party firm to do a an analysis of their, their um, racial disparities in the county. And they they did an excellent job. It's a, it's a comprehensive report, and they came in with a roadmap in terms of what the police department could do to make um, positive change in terms of reducing the racial demographics. The, the second thing is we need to develop metrics and targets to measure and reduce these racial disparities. If the police department doesn't have a specific, have, haven't developed specific metrics, how are they going to ever know how to, how, how to make things better. So we need to develop those metrics and targets to measure and reduce those re racial disparities. And the third request is that we need a legal requirement for uh, the law enforcement agencies to report this information to the public, including demographic data on officer engagements with the public. Now, this is not new in, 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 in Maryland. This, um, how, Mo Montgomery County has had this for two or three years. And every year, the police department has to provide demographic demographic data in terms of their engagement with the public. Right now, the only uh, legal requirement the Howard County Police Department has right now is with the state of Maryland. The state of Maryland requires all police departments to provide um, uh, racial demographic uh, data for traffic stops only. So it doesn't include things like uh, use of force, um, citations, and other types of things like that. And um, that's the problem. There's no legal requirement for Howard County to do it. So they they basically do what they report, what they want to report. And you might have seen a lot of, uh, you know, press about this new dashboard that they have. The dashboard, in our opinion, is uh, is a failure because it only reports what we already know. We, we already know that the um, we know the racial demographics of the traffic stops because the Maryland state requires that them that requires them to report it. So they're reporting that. So that's not new information. Uh, but what they aren't telling you with the traffic stops is that even though they're showing you the actual stops, they're not showing you how that reflects, how that compares to the actual demographics in Maryland, which in, in I'm sorry, in Howard County, which is about 20, 21%. So they might be showing 40, 50% of the traffic stops are in Howard County are for black African Americans, but they're not actually telling you that the demographics of Blacks in Howard County are about 20%. Similarly, they have on this dashboard, um, you know, reports of crime, different, re uh, you know, house break-ins, car thefts, and th those types of things. You can do a deep dive into the crime, but that's a crime report that has nothing to do with racial demographics. So it's a total failure. They, um, they, they even the press conference, they talk about, they wanted to take down all the bar barriers for, um, um, the public not being able to get this information. 
and the dashboard is really, in our opinion, a failure. So uh, I'm here that evening to ask for your support. Um, we'd like you, if you could, to uh, spread the word and, and um, share this, these racial disparities with people that you know in the community. We are starting a uh, email campaign. Um, there's a link, I'll show you how to, how to do that. Um, and this link is very easy, it's on Action Network. All you do is one click, two, two or three clicks, and you're sending an email directly to the county executive, the council members, the police department, the sheriff's department, and the police accountability board. So all of those uh, people will be alerted that um, this is not acceptable and we need to move forward with uh, resolving this. We're also going to have a um, press conference tomorrow um, at um, 10 o'clock in front of the George Howard Viet Building. I'm not sure how we know it's one of those things where you invite people to come, but you don't know who's going to come. So, but we're going to we're going to have a press conference tomorrow. We've invited the press to be there, and uh, we're also going to put it on our on, on our Twitter or X page um, so people can see it. And we want to alert the, the public about this problem and ask them to participate in our email campaign to let Howard County leadership know that this is not acceptable. So this is our QR code for the uh, email campaign that goes directly to Action Network. And you can also go to our website, um, patf-hoco.com. And on that front page where it says um, what's hot, if you go to the email campaign link, that will also bring you there as well. I'm also going to send Jake a copy of this deck and hopefully he can share that with um, the, the people on the call here so that they can see it. And then finally, this is our uh, contact. Um, if you have any more questions uh, that you would like to ask us, uh, visit our website and or you can follow us on X on Twitter. Um, these are the ways you can contact us. So I'll stop talking and I'm open to any questions that you have. I recognize it's late in the evening and you probably want to get some dinner or get some rest. So I'll, I'll be, uh, I'm, but I am open to um, answering any questions you might have. So I see hands up. I, I'm not great with the chat room. So I'm going to look at my screen and, and just ask on, on the screen. The first person I see is Yvonne, you have your hand up. So I'm going to go to you and then I'll go across the screen the people that have their hand up. I thank you for that, Ted. Um... So I, I don't I don't want to in any way diminish your your report, um, but we know that this happens all over the country, right? Almost yes. everywhere. Yes. So my question to you is, do you know of any training program for the police which actually works in cutting this down? Is there a training program? I, I, Yvonne, I think it's more than a training program. I think we have to have a holistic look at this. I don't think one training program, I've, I was in corporate for many years and we had training programs, but it's more the culture, it's the training programs, it's a variety of different things. So I'll give you an example. The situation that happened in Charleston after the murder of Walter Scott, they brought in this third party or um, company. The name of the company is CNA. They're based in Arlington, Virginia. They went down there and they did a holistic um, analysis. They looked at the, the demographics of the police department, how many females, how many males, what were the racial demographics and so forth. They looked at the training programs. They talked to the community. And so they gathered all of this information and they came back with something like 40 to 50 recommendations. And then there's a program of implementing these recommendations. These problems didn't start overnight and of course they're not gonna be solved overnight. But the North Charleston is now going forward with these recommendations and putting them in place. Um, now, I haven't tracked to find out what the results of that is, but I, I don't think there's one magic bullet to excuse the expression. But I want to, don't want to use the word bullet, but one magic um, 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 solution for this. I don't think we can say if you put in a training program, you're going to solve this because that's not going to change the culture if you have been if you've had terrible hiring practice and so forth. So I think it's a holistic approach. That's why we're, our first recommendation is let's bring in an LEA data expert that's knowledgeable about how to solve these problems that have a track record of working with counties across the country and that can help counties navigate the things they need to do. I hope that answered your question, All right? 
the next it, uh, it, it partially answers my question the problem of course and we know that it's institutional racism the fact is that racism has not gone away uh, and so the police departments being out there in the community, they reflect that more than other institutions, perhaps. That's mm -hmm. why we see it and we hear about it. So the question is, can we, of course we can, if it takes long enough, uh, change the culture of the whole country to bring it to the country's consciousness that it exists and we need to do something about it or we need to start doing something about it. That's why I'm asking about any kind of program that works. I understand you're looking at it holistically. And of course right, so it has would... to be looked that way. But how do you train people not to be racists and not to, not to think racially when they're out there in the public doing their jobs? Some of the things that we read, and I'll what I'll also do, I'll because I'll send to Jake, and then you can read it as well. I will send you the CNA report. One of the things that they did was to, uh, when you talk about how do you train people not to be the racist, that's a big challenge. But one of the things that they found in this report is getting, um, making, having them talk directly to the public, and having the public have a lot more say in terms of what the hiring practices are having more um, meetings with them face-to-face. Uh, -face. So you're talking to a human being to a human being. Um, a lot of those things are the things that came out of this report and I'll, I, I can send that to you, you can take a look at it. Um, and again, there's no there's no magic solution. <laughs> it's This is something, as you said, it's a national program. Now you said, how do we solve the national issue? We, 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 we boost from that. We, we said that it's, we have more um, involvement and more um, a way to make a difference locally. We're, we, 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 we support anything nationally that's along this line, but we said that, um, you know, we're, we're a very small group. We have, our, you know, good coalition partners like yourself, but we can't solve the national problem. So what we try to do is solve the things that we can see locally. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Jenny, I see your hand up. You're on mute. On mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Great presentation, Ted. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. And I just have a quick question. The, I, the slide that you had, I think it said 20% of Howard County, uh, the population is Black. Is that correct? Yes. yes. You okay. want me to bring that uh, back up again? No, or, no, no. It's yeah. okay. Is that the driving population or is that the total population? That's the total population of Howard County is roughly about 20, 21% African-American. Okay. Would it, is it worse than if you just got what the actual <laughs> percentage is based on the, the uh, you know, legal age to drive and there'd be more higher percentage than if stops because the percentage of the population... Anyway, you can figure it out. You, you see yeah, where that I that I, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but because they use the same uh, measuring tool for all the races, so you basically are looking at you know all whites, all uh, African Americans, right. all Hispanics, all Chinese, yeah, I Asian. Get it. it it's kind of it kind of um, negates that because you're looking all at the same measurement. So, but it's roughly about twenty one percent, and the stops were roughly twice the demographic. So you're looking at you know, 40%, 45% in some cases. And when you're looking at some of the other interactions with the police department, they were even worse, you know, and even going down to juvenile citations. I mean, I mean, it, across the board, it was not good. And uh, we were, we're just very concerned that, you know, leadership has known this for, well, actually, this has been going on for years. We're just putting it to paper, but, but this has been going on for many years um, in Howard County. Yeah, Did no, I, I'm not, I, I think, you know, it, it, I understand, but I, I just am curious about whether the basis for their data needs work, but that's not my field, whether it's white, black, or anything, it should actually be drivers. But at any, any rate, I'm just trying to understand it. Is there any analysis of the reason for stops so that you can compare, um, you know, do they have to write that out as to why they stopped this person or that person, regardless of race. And then, I mean, you want the race in, included in there so that then you could do an analysis of by even cop, all the stops and the reason they gave for the stop 
and then you know see if there's a pattern there is what I'm getting at. Right, that's a great question. So the Maryland State dashboard actually excludes things that would negate a race stop, race or racially based stop. For example, they exclude from the um, information traffic stops for radar. For example, because radar, they, they don't you don't see a race. You're down, you know, you're a mile away, half a mile away. I don't know what the distance is, but they right. pull the radar gun out and they say you're going X amount and they stop. So the Maryland State dashboard has about seven or eight exclusions. They are specifically looking at traffic stops related to a, that's a visual. That's that's right. visual. And I, I don't have I apologize. I don't have those definitions. But if you go to the website that we have in our deck, when I send you, you can go to the website and they will actually give you the definition of those stops that were um how they defined a traffic stop. That was one of the things actually Chief Dare said at one of the PAB meetings that there are types of stops that they wouldn't know the race, but he wasn't familiar with the definition on the dashboard because the dashboard actually excluded those types of stops. And it was only looking at stops that would have been, the officer would have had an opportunity to look at a person's race. Well, that, that's the one I'm, I'm talking about is, uh, is there you know any data on those type of stops that would give the the reason the police officer gave for the stop, maybe the response the, the driver had, and then race and sort of doing more in-depth analysis to try and get to maybe there's X number of cops that really need a lot more work. Well, yeah, and well, Ginny, that is exactly why we need a third party data expert, because they have the like the, we talked to this group in in in, in Arlington. They have algorithms, they work with the police department and they have algorithms to be able to go in there and do exactly what you just said. You can do a, a deeper dive into the officers. You can do a deeper dive into zip code. You yeah. can do, you, know, you can also look at how many were Howard County versus other counties, how many were from out of state and so forth. So that's why, and you can't have the police department do, do their own checking, right? So that's why we're, that's the first recommendation we have is to bring in a third party expert and they have this particular firm that we talked about. I'm not recommending them because there's several, but they, this particular firm actually has all of the apps and the algorithms to be able to do the deeper dive, to do a better understanding in terms of maybe all of those stops were five officers. You never know, you know, to, to your point, it could be five officers. So we don't, that data is not available to us. We're just at the, we're at the high, high level area saying, we need to bring in an expert. We're not, I'm not a data person expert, but we need to bring in an expert that does this, understands uh, police yeah, data yeah. and knows how to analyze it. Yeah, and I All think right. the important thing is before you can analyze, you need to know what data, relevant data that you want to collect and then collect it. Yeah, so th that's great. If you can get right. to that point, that would be very interesting. Right. Thank you for doing this, for working on it. Thank you. Thanks for the support. Uh, Kat? Kate or Kat, I think. Kat, yeah, Kat. Okay, just Kat. a really Sorry. quick question. You said yes. Montgomery County also uh, does reporting. Do the statistics uh, bear out the same thing that they're pulling yes. over more Un Unfortunately, Yes, unfortunately, Howard County is not alone. Montgomery is pretty bad. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, several other counties are, are, are likewise as bad. Um, but okay. I think one of the things that we've, we've heard when we talk to people in Howard County, they don't they don't believe this is happening in Howard County. They use, oh, that's happening in Baltimore County. That's happening in Baltimore, but we're kind of, it's not happening here. We talked to one of the council members, I'm not going to mention a name, who said they were shocked to hear this. You know, they were, they this stuff doesn't happen in Howard County. That was my other question. Given we have an African-American county executive, one of our council members, Opal Jones, is also an African-American man. And yet you say you haven't met with them. Are they not concerned? Well, we met with him on other campaigns. He was not as um, supportive. I mean, he was he listened to us and he met with us. But I think that the people that the council members that have been very supportive have been um, Liz Walsh and um, Deb Young. Um, they've been extremely supportive. They were helpful in getting some of those legislative changes um, done when we were, when they were looking at mm -hmm. putting in the PAB. And I okay. think um, Rigby helped one of the tie votes a couple of times, but those were the people that we kind of depended on. Now, I don't, we, we have, two... now in, fair, in fairness to the, women. to the other people, we have not talked to 
uh, Liz Walsh, we were talking to her in January about this issue, mm -hmm. and we're trying to set up a meeting with um, Opal and um, Youngman. So those, we have not talked to them yet, and we plan to do so in January. So I can't give you um, a response in terms of whether or not they will support these recommendations or not. I, I just don't understand why they haven't jumped at the chance. And I just saw that the body worn cameras almost was, you know, not even going to happen. Yet we're supposed to be that progressive out here, uh, right. full of Democrats. And yet right. Montgomery County's had theirs for a very long time. And I think it's very effective program. But I also want to ask you about traffic cameras. Do you think they're more effective than actually having traffic cops out there? and being fair and, and equitable. Our traffic, I'm sorry. Yeah, like that, speed but, cameras, red uh -huh. light cameras, all that stuff, things I don't like personally, but is that more <laughs> effective? I I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not an expert on this uh, cat, so I'm not really sure. I can't, I can't answer that. Sorry, I'm not. You know, I I, I would kind of like to, to bring in an expert on some of this stuff. We're we're kind of saying we a lot of the the uh, answers we don't know, so we'd like to bring in an expert to make that decision. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that question for you. Okay, thank you, thank you, and thank you so much for doing this work. It's very important. Thank you, Kat. Appreciate you, um, Marge. Yeah. Um, what is the racial makeup of Howard County Police Department? Is it mostly white or well, well i i don't have that information i can get that that's a great question i know at the senior level it is mostly white yes the senior because we met with the senior team uh in a meeting with chief Durr, and that was uh mostly white so that that senior team is i don't have the racial demographics of the police department themselves though okay that would be one of the things that the um third party would come in and do an analysis, look at their hiring practices, not only just um, racial, but also gender as well. One of the studies that I found is that they found that female officers have a better um, way of de-escalating situations and coming out with better outcomes a lot of times. Um, and that's, that's their studies going around with that. So female officers have been, um, um, you know, great assets to police departments. I don't know what the gender, demographics. Are. So we should be looking not only at racial um, ish demographics, but also gender demographics as well. Okay. okay. All right. So I think that is all of the questions that I see there. And I want to thank you so much for your support. And if you, I will send the deck to, to everybody. And if you could support our email campaign, campaign, or if you have any questions whatsoever, please reach out and let us know. All right. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye now. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Ted. Great presentation. I hope everybody fills out that letter writing campaign. We put it in the chat. We'll send it out via email. Um, Jake, yeah, that, um, one thing on the email campaign, we found that, believe it or not, they, you, people don't think they're effective, but they actually got us past the finish line on the funding for the body-worn camera because there were so many emails that went to... Um, uh, Dr. Ball, and it was embarrassing because they were talking about it was a, only like a one and a half million dollar um, cost, and they have a, almost a, what's a two to three billion dollar budget, and you, we all know that you can find one and a half million dollars by just you know opening up your 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 checkbooks. Right? <laughs> you know, so it was a ludic ludicrous um, you know um, uh, answer, and the emails. I think embarrass them into doing doing something. So I think these numbers, these stats, the stats are what they are, and the fact that they don't, they're not doing anything about it. They've known it. Uh, I think with people sending in emails, I think it can really make a difference. So I appreciate if you could do that. Take care. Bye bye now. Yes, thank you, Ted. Although Joel, did you have something to say? Been trying sorry, to put in the Jim. chat that if you go to the county's new traffic dashboard, it answers some of these questions. Um, it says that forty percent are black stops, fifty percent oh, yeah, are Howard yeah. County. But when you click on Howard County, the black stops goes down to thirty five percent. So Joel, the the trap, the Joel, the the, the dashboard 
for traffic stops is just a repeat of what's on the Maryland state um, dashboard. So it's not like they're giving us any new information. And when you look at the traffic stops, um, depending on which year, which you can actually go through several years, you can look at that, but you're, you also need to compare that to the actual demographics of um, Howard County for those different races. Yeah, they didn't say it would cover and everything. But, I'm sorry? Not going to cover everything, but the data is only as good as the officer acquires. Well, there, there's two pieces to this. They're, they're, they're reporting on the dashboard traffic stops, and that's what's required by Maryland state law. But what they are not reporting are the demographics for other incidents or engagement with the public. So they're not reporting the demographics for, for arrests, for use of force for citations, for juvenile citations, and so forth and so on. That information, we actually met with them before the dashboard was completed, and we requested to provide input on the dashboard, and they ignored our recommendation. We had a meeting with uh, Chief Darren, his, his uh, senior team. Uh, they told us that this dashboard was coming out, and we requested several times to meet with them. They said initially they were going to meet with us, uh, then they said they couldn't meet with us, and they asked us to send us send them the recommendations. So we sent them our recommendations, and lo and behold, the dashboard comes out, and it does not speak to anything as it relates to um, demographics for the other things other than what they had to do statutorily by law on the Maryland uh, website. That's why we're asking one of our recommendations is that they have to do it legally, uh, legislatively legal. That's why we work with the county council to make sure that they, it's not just something they do if they want to do it, it's something that they're required to do, similar to what we do in, in Montgomery County. All right, I'll let you go. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, the spy. You can hop off. Yeah, there, there he goes. There he goes. Uh, before anyone else can ask any other questions. So uh, thanks to Ted. Uh, again, hope everybody you know does do the email writing campaign. Um, I was going to make a joke about, we have 30 more minutes of slides, uh, to go through, but, uh, I don't even want to joke about that. And so, um, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good meeting. And, um, we will see you again next month. Take care.